to my far right is Charles Frazier. Charles Frazier received his PhD in English from the University of South Carolina in 1986. Armed with a PhD, but with no formal training in creative writing, he published his first novel, All Mountain, to universal acclaim in 1997. It was likely an unprecedented literary achievement. This gripping novel, which was brought to the world by a first-time novelist, first-time agent, and first-time editor, went on to win the 1997 National Book Award. Fold Mountain was adapted in 2003 into a major motion picture starring Jude Law, Nicole Kidman, and Renee Zellweger, as most of you probably know. And was nominated for seven Academy Awards. Zellweger took home the Oscar for Best Actress in a Supporting Role. Frazier took the claim of second novel, 13 Woods, was the New York Times bestseller, and his third novel, Nine Woods, which came out just last year, is a frightful and compelling work which I believe is utterly ripe for adaptation. Please welcome Charles Frazier. Charles, uh, I, I'm speaking of being included in the process or not being included in the process, it sounds like you've actually had a pretty uh, good experience being included by the director, Anthony Miguelo. Yeah. Well, it was, it was great because I was included in lots of things and had really no responsibility. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting uh, experience. It went on for a long time. It took uh, uh, seven years, I think, from rights were bought um, in June of 97, I think. Uh, I was a first novelist. Um, my book had been out for two weeks. Um, I'd been out doing a, a few little book tour things in North Carolina. And I have a, a witness back here to what, uh, what huge crowds I was uh, drawing at the time, uh, Jan. You're saying 10? I've always said 12. <laughs> I'm supposed to count the bookstore employee. <laughs> but two weeks about after the book was published, my agent called and said, you need to be home all day tomorrow, and there's going to be a phone call at this time, and this time, and this time, and this time. And it's going to be producers and directors and screenwriters wanting to buy your book. And that, that was just crazy. <laughs> and people called up, and some of them were famous people, um, saying, we can make a movie of your book bigger. We can make it faster. We can make you executive producer. Um, not executive producer, associate producer. And I didn't know much about movies, but I knew that really didn't hold a lot of power. <laughs> <laughs> and then Anthony McGillicom, and he had his movie English Patient had just won, I think it was nine Academy Awards. And the first thing he said was, I can promise you one thing if I make the movie of this book it will not be as successful as the English version. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, here's, here's the guy. Um, so he, I, it, there was just no question after a very honest and straightforward um, sales pitch, uh, if you could call it that, I, I liked that it was. Um, and he was, we have a lot similar, had a lot similar backgrounds. He died, if you don't know, uh, way too young, uh, all that long ago. Um, he was uh, he had done some teaching at universities, but not really in a fully tenure track uh, role. And, uh, had, had moved down to theater and then films, and uh, so he's, later on, after everything was was signed, sealed, and all that, he said, "Well, I want to come to North Carolina. Can we take a week and just have a road trip?" And so he he um, came to Asheville. And we were going to go all over North Carolina and then down to Wilmington to take a look at the studios there. He, uh, he thought he was coming to called Mountain World, and we were staying at the Grove Park Inn. <laughs> <laughs> but he had a big puffy down jacket and hiking boots, <laughs> and uh, they, 
they wanted to you know, compass a meal at the, the really nice restaurant where <laughs> Mark in, you know, wearing jacket and ties, so we didn't get to do that. <laughs> but he, you know, he didn't know a thing about Western North Carolina, but he was intent on learning. And came back to, uh, to North Carolina over and over during that, that seven years with every intention of making the movie in Western North Carolina. And we had a lot of time to talk about movies, about the way movies tell stories, about the, the things that movies can do so easily and well and naturally, like the, you know, like the descriptive things, you know, the, you, you, you've got a house, that you bang up three seconds, you've got the idea. Um, he also said that the camera is not selective, you know, you, you, it sees what you show it. Uh, we talked about time, about how um, really badly movies handle time and how fluidly novels can move back and forth through time. Um, and really when you get down to it, how, how much better has anybody ever handled time in a movie than a clock running fast, forward or backwards, or a calendar page with pages flipping? It just doesn't want to do that. Movies want to, to move forward. Uh, Prefer preferably at a, at a rapid clip. Um, and we talked about the screenplay a lot. And he, every draft of the screenplay I got, and we would talk about it, and, and, um, and I would be arguing, look, you've got all the violence in the book, but the quiet parts of the book are underrepresented. And um, uh, just the, the way Ruby was presented, we talked a lot about that. Um, um, all of those kinds of emphasis, because he had to, there was a lot that he had to leave out, obviously, uh, and how he accounted for those was an issue. He was sending the screenplay to a lot of people. Shelby Foot got it a few times, and especially made comments, some things like, um, oh, like the soldiers, Confederate soldiers rolling cigarettes. I remember that one comment of his at the margin was like, well, unlikely, maybe smoking bombs. <laughs> Lots of details like that that he, uh, he contributed. Um, and then when the time came for finding locations, he and um, Dante Ferretti, who's won two or three Academy Awards for our direction, um, came and we went beat around on back roads, went to little old country churches and uh, cabins and found every location they needed for the movie. And um, so after all that, I mean, I, I can't even count how many trips uh, Anthony made up there. Um, there was a day when the money guy from Hollywood, from the studio came. <laughs> And there was a meeting at the Grove Park Inn, and I was sitting there, and I wasn't understanding all of the, the financial movie terminology, but I could see faces getting very tight. And then he came up with a number, and it was um, not that far from $150 million, and you could see the faces get really tight. And, um, and then when it was over, Anthony just said, I We've got, we've got each problem. Uh, and the solution to that problem became to film a lot of the movie in Romania. And it was a, an enormous disappointment for me. I was just sick uh, at the notion that, that they were going to do the movie there. I argued with, with everybody uh, in a position of power in the movie until they quit listening to me. Um, but uh, they filmed some in Charleston and some little bits. Uh, you know, Richmond and Wilmington, a few, a few little um, landscape type shots in Western North Carolina. The fall colors in Romania, and they were they were very inclusive. I mean, everything that was going on, they called somebody, one of the producers or Anthony would call and say, "We're going to be in Nashville doing the music. Ralph Stanley's going to be there. Jack White's going to be there." Um, all these, all these great musicians, you know, can you come down for a few days? And then 
complaining about it. They wanted, they wanted me to come over there, and I was mad. I was not going to Romania, and absolutely not going to Romania. Um, but a friend of mine, uh, Dirk Powell, if any of you know old Donald Poo, he's a, a hired as a consultant. And what he would do is, when people were faking playing the fiddle, he would adjust the bow angle like that much and make, I think, three trips to Romania to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he came back from the first trip and said, the people are walking around over there with tattered copies of your book in their backpacks, and they had nothing to do with the decision to take it to Romania. Get your ass over here and support them if we need something. So, uh, so we went, and, um, and my daughter, who's somewhere in here, um, when we got ready to leave after a couple of weeks, um, she was 18, and there were lots of really handsome young actors. <laughs> and one, the one of the producers said, can Annie, can Annie stay? And she had been doing lighting stand-in for Natalie Portman uh, for the two weeks. And, and my wife and I said, you know, that's really nice. And she's had a great time. We've had a great time. Uh, but uh, but you, you know, you've done your duty. Uh, we, we need to head home. And he said, no, no, we need her. We're short on, on, on production assistants. We, we, need, we need her. And uh, so we let her stay. Before long, she was standing around with a headset, uh, yelling, shut up, at uh, an Italian you know, sound crew, and, um, yelling, shut up, and remaining. <laughs> had a great time. Um, it, it was, I mean, it's a weird experience when you see this thing that's just been in your head. Um, the, the first day in Romania, we went to Ada's house which was a big, fully furnished house. You could move, except, that it, uh, except that it didn't have plumbing, you could, you could move into it and live. Um, every building that Dante built worked. The old, um, the old corn mill that he built, you could ground corn in it. It worked. Uh, the American ambassador came and looked at it and said, amazing that you could find in Romania an old mill that looks so much like one that would be in the But walked into that house, sat in the parlor, a, uh, a scene was being filmed in the kitchen with, uh, with, with Renee Zellweger and, uh, and Nicole Kidman and uh, Brendan Gleeson and Ethan Supley. And when the, there was a break, Nicole Kidman came walking into the parlor in her Ada clothes and said, oh, I'm so nervous to meet you, which seemed weird in itself. But <laughs> this, this person that you've had in your head for, at that point more than a decade um, made real um, and not the way you pictured it. <laughs> so so uh, nothing to complain about. I don't know. I, the thing I came away, the main thing I came away with, seeing the process, seeing the all the people that get to have an opinion in a movie, not just all the people giving Anthony advice or saying I don't like this little bit of the screenplay. Or, uh, he really invited that. Uh, he, you know, I mean, he. he could have, uh, you know, could have just kind of <coughs> passed, just acted like he was paying attention to that. He, he was making revisions, and we would argue about revisions. Uh, he, he invited people to comment. It was, it was clear he was the director, and I went into the thing trying to have, always have the idea that the book is my expression of this material, these characters, this, these situations. The movie is Anthony's expression of, of that. Um, but he, you know, he was very inclusive, um, um, you know, listened to a lot of stuff. Um, and a lot of that stuff was coming from the money people. The, you know, for a novelist, that's appalling to think that you've got 
and some guy who thinks he can tell you how your your heart ought to be because they gave me a few bucks. A few hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, he sailed through that with just such calm. Uh, I didn't get to see the part where they hired the Romanian army and blew up hundreds of acres and did the Battle of Petersburg. Uh, but uh, he, he just, uh, he, was, he was an amazing, uh, amazing guy, a real, uh, um, a real artist, and uh, um, somebody who's, I'd love to see him in the movies.